Good morning and welcome to the second day of Brain and Mind Symposium 2020. My name is Marco Hubble and I will be hosting this first session of the day with uh, Anaï Göring. Um, we'll start with Ignite Talks by seven principal investigators from University of Helsinki and Aalto University. Uh, there may be time for one short question after each talk. Okay, let me introduce Iris Hovato from Helsinki University. Welcome. Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. I will share my screen with you. Can you see it well? Yes, perfect. Great. So I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work. So here's my, here's my lab and these are the individuals who carried out the research that I'm going to be talking about today. So the key question that my lab is trying to answer is what makes some individuals susceptible and others resilient to stress-related psychiatric diseases? We all experience stress in life, but only some of us develop psychiatric symptoms like anxiety or depressive-like symptoms. And we're interested in the underlying mechanisms of susceptibility and resi resilience. We are especially interested in anxiety disorders that are the most common mental diseases. The most common ones are panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social phobia, agoraphobia or fear of public places, and specific phobias like fear of heights and spiders. So as a model, we use um, several different inbred mouse strains. So animals within one strain are genetically identical. And if we keep them in the similar environment, any phenotypic differences between the animals are due to genotypic differences between them. So during my postdoc, uh, we used a transcriptomic based approach to identify genes that regulate innate anxiety in these strains. But in my own lab, I have become very interested in gene environment interactions in anxiety disorders. So we know that they have a modest heritability and environmental risk factors such as early life adversities, chronic psychosocial stress and severe trauma. But very little is known about these gene environment interactions. So as a model in mice, we use uh, chronic psychosocial stress. The model is called chronic social defeat stress, which involves a confrontation of two male mice, uh, 10 minutes of direct contact and 24 hours of sensory contact, uh, 10 days in a row. And we've carried out this protocol in four different inbred strains. And what we found was that 129 bulb and DBA2 animals, most of the animals were susceptible to stress so they showed social avoidance after this 10 day stress protocol. And this is a sign of increased anxiety. However, most of the C57 black six animals were resilient to stress. So they didn't show social avoidance even after this 10 day stress protocol. So uh, susceptibility and resilience to chronic psychosocial stress is genetically controlled. So what are the underlying mechanisms? To address this question, we dissected three brain regions that are associated with anxiety and stress behaviors, and we carried out RNA sequencing. We found an enrichment of oligodendrocyte-related genes in these brain regions. Now, oligodendrocytes are the myelinating cells of the central nervous system. So our next question was, um, does chronic stress alter myelin thickness in the brain. And we carried out electron microscopy to answer this question. And we found that there were region and mouse strain specific differences in myelin thickness after stress. So during development, oligodendrocyte precursor cells 
matter into oligodendrocytes that then wrap their myelin around the axon. And this myelin profile is established during development. But it has become clear that there is also adaptive myelin plasticity in the adults. So experience and neuronal activity continue to drive oligodendrocyte lineage and myelin profile alterations, uh, for example, uh, in motor learning or due to social interaction. So these OPC cells are active also in the adult brain. So what can this all mean? We showed that chronic stress leads to increased or decrease of myelin thickness in specific brain regions. So more myelin was not always better. And myelination of course influences conduction velocity of the axon. And stress has been associated with decreased neuronal synchrony. So we're now asking a question, could resilience to stress be associated with the ability to regulate myelin thickness and spatial connectivity? And we're answering this question from uh, with several different kinds of experiments. So we are looking at um, effects of neuronal activity using dreads and immunohistochemistry to see whether neuronal activity can change um, myelination after stress. Um, we've also carried out oligodendrocyte specific RNA sequencing. And we're testing hypotheses derived from this experiment in in vitro stress models where we have oligodendrocyte uh, cell lines, but also primary oligodendrocytes that allow us to study oligodendrocytes from different inbred mouse strains to see what the effect of the genetic background is on these responses. And if you're interested in this model, you should go and see Adrian's poster later today. We are also studying myelination in human anxiety. So together with Tuukka Rai and Jana Suvisari, we have carried out diffusion tensor imaging in young adults with anxiety symptoms and our preliminary results show that uh, they may be reduced um, uh, uh, mean diffusivity in forceps minor in individuals with anxiety symptoms compared to those without. And we're also studying genetic variants in myelination related genes to understand whether such genetic factors could confer susceptibility to human anxiety. Thank you. That's, that's all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you, Yuis. Uh, oh, we have a question in the chat, a so short one. Is myelin plasticity different in different brain regions responsible for anxiety? Uh, yes, it is actually. So when we looked at the different brain regions, and if I can still share my uh, screen with you, I can actually show you one more slide because I was anticipating uh, this question. Um, so what, when, we, when we divided the axons into small, medium and large actions in the uh, B6 and D2 mouse strains and looked at myelin thickness, we noticed that, uh, for example, in the medial prefrontal cortex, resilient mice had uh, thicker myelin compared to control animals. Um, in the D2 mice, the, um, there was susceptible animals had thicker myelin than resilient mice in the medium sized um, neurons and so forth. So um, I think these differences are very specific to different brain regions. And we would be very interested in looking at these different circuits to understanding why sometimes you might need thicker and sometimes thinner myelin and how that relates to the resilience and susceptibility. So these results are described in this paper. Okay, a short one. Did you look at activity and connectivity with electrophysiology? MEA could be a nice tool. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. We haven't done that so far, but 
it's something that we would be very interested in doing in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank well, you. thank you for coming, Iris. And our next speaker will be Iro Jaskelainen from, uh, uh, from Aalto University. You are um, you're still muted? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. I just got a message I'm promoted as a panelist. Okay. Uh, so I will share the screen and uh, get going since I know there's very little time. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, so I'm going to tell about uh, Brain and Mind Lab. So we're using movies and narratives as naturalistic stimuli during our imaging to study social cognition and emotions. I mean, we're doing other things too, but, but this is uh, one major uh, focus area. And um, so basically uh, to those who are not yet uh, familiar with this uh, social cognition, roughly means understanding and predicting others' intentions, emotions, and goal directly behavior. So you can see this picture here. And what is quite amazing is that our brain is able to uh, make sense of uh, 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 what's going on here in this picture just by, by looking at it you know, very quickly. We uh, figure out that this is a young couple, they're looking for a wedding ring, and this is somebody who uh, is uh, selling them the uh, wedding ring. Um, and, and, and uh, we do it this uh, did this with very little effort, and we don't uh, typically even pause to you know wonder how this is possible uh, to accomplish. And and most of the brain uh, actually, I say the big one of the biggest challenges with the brain uh, is really figuring out this this social interactions, intentions of others, etc. Okay, and so why do we use movies and narratives as stimuli? It's because some research questions can only, or let's say, best be addressed with naturalistic stimuli. Uh, and this includes social cognition, emotions, uh, processing of humor, etc. Uh, also, if one looks at the economic relevance of social cognition, uh, there are these uh, indica indications, uh, for example, that authors and costs the UK more than heart disease, cancer, and stroke combines. And this might be explained by the um, uh, nature of uh, autism as a lifelong disease. Uh, it uh, affects about 1% of the population so, so, and, and requires rehabilitation often. So, so this uh, might explain this quite striking uh, claim. We use mostly uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which is invented in 1990s. Uh, it's based on measuring different magnetic properties of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And, and basically the take home message is we get a time course of local hematic activity for each three-dimensional pixel of the brain. And so uh, movies and narratives are also time courses. Uh, there are phases in some parts, uh, not in others. There are hands in some parts, not in others. Call directed activity in, in some parts of the movie, not in others. And then we can uh, look at how these these uh, time courses in the movie and, and, and how these uh, time courses in the brain correspond. And of course, one has to take into account the uh, subjective experiences of the subjects that we're asking with uh, uh, self-reports. Uh, we're using behavioral methods to uh, get an idea of those, and, and then it's it's a combination of three uh, different kinds of data: what's there in the movie, what's in the brain, and what's there uh, in the subjective experiences. And so, just to give you a couple of examples uh, of our research, uh, we set forth to ask this question: Is perception of social interaction shaped by knowledge of genetic kinship? And there's this kinship premium effect that has been behavioral demonstrated which means willingness to exert more effort on behalf of kin versus emotionally as close others. And so we show the movie uh, where there is uh, to uh, happen an organ donor donation and the uh, sisters, one sick, one the uh, to be donor are seen on two different runs as genetic versus adopted. And then we simply uh, calculate these inverse of the correlations uh, and contrast between the genetic and non-genetic uh, conditions. And so behaviorally, 
Uh, we don't really see any differences between these two conditions, but in terms of brain, brain activity, uh, with warm colors here, you can see where uh, intersubject correlation has been higher in the genetic viewing condition and with uh, cold colors where this has been higher uh, in uh, the case of uh, adopted sisters on the screen. Uh, so for the brain, it uh, drastically changes how this movie is being viewed, whether the sisters are genetic or adopted, even though the subjects are not so much aware of that. Uh, also, what we've done uh, are uh, machine learning classification schemes to um, uh, classify the uh, emotional states that subjects are in. And as you can see, there's a fairly good accuracy um, in figuring out uh, what uh, emotional state uh, the subjects are in. And these are based on distributed patterns of activity very much in the midline structures. Uh, uh, here you can see in the picture. Uh, also, uh, something that we're pursuing is uh, higher fMRI temporal sampling uh, that we've here shown in, improves co Granger causality estimates of effective brain connectivity. Uh, so that was uh, that was pretty much it. And uh, I hope I am on time. And uh, if there are any questions, thank you. Uh, there is. One question, uh, interesting data. Do you expect research, researchers to move to complex naturalistic stimuli on Mars, or is there still a lot, of, a lot to be learned using simplistic stimuli? Yeah, I, I think that uh, this is a really great question. And, and maybe to, to some extent, yes, uh, there will be an increase and we're seeing this. We just um, have, have uh, published our, uh, uh, this uh, fairly comprehensive review article in your image. You can find it in this uh, in press articles if you're interested. Um, uh, but I would say that uh, using a continuum of from simple to complex uh, is actually the, the best approach. Of course, resources are limited. So some groups probably want to stick with uh, simple stimuli. And, you know, if you're using these naturalistic stimuli, they uh, they do take uh, quite much skills and resources, but in the optimal world, uh, we would uh, really sort of design a continuum uh, from uh, from very simple to very naturalistic, uh, and then inspect the phenomena across them. So I would say this is a, in some ways, a comp you know, these two approaches are complementary. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. I don't see any more questions, so maybe we can move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, our next speaker is Eho Kastren from Helsinki University. Welcome. Hi, can you can you can you see me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. let me see whether I can share my screen. I just had a last moment uh, problems with my with my screens and and camera, but uh, but uh, let's see whether this is yeah this is working. And now I just need to get this out of the way so that I can I can share my start the presentation. Can you see? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so my uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, Ignite talk. And uh, my lab has been working for, for a long time with the neurotrophic factors. I was actually a postdoc with Hans Stern and other, uh, when BDNF, the brain down neurotrophic factor was discovered in his lab. And I've been working with BDNF and track B signaling uh, uh, ever since. Uh, BDNF and track b are, are critical regulators of neural connectivity, and now it has turned subsequently that uh, turned out that uh, they are also very important in uh, in uh, regulation of plasticity. And uh, my lab has been interested in uh, in uh, finding out whether uh, the activity of uh, of uh, neurotrophic factors and particularly BDNF can be boosted uh, by drug treatments. And uh, we have actually focused on the track B uh, receptor for BDNF, 
Uh, and uh, early on, so, uh, several uh, years ago, we already almost now 20 years ago, we found that antidepressant drugs, when they are given to, uh, uh, to mice, they increase the phosphorylation of track B receptors, which is indicative of, uh, of BDNF, increased BDNF binding to this. So uh, here we have looked at uh, fluoxetine and imipramine two drugs, but subsequently we looked at a number of different uh, uh, antidepressants uh, belonging to the uh, different to, to different classes, and they all increase uh, track B signaling. And now, during the last few years, we have uh, been working on uh, how uh, on the question how this uh, uh, how this happens, uh, and we have actually discovered that. Uh, uh, these antidepressants, they directly bind uh, to track B. So here we are looking at drug binding of, uh, of uh, uh, fluoxetine uh, to track B, and we can find bi binding at uh, low micromolar uh, concentrations. So this is a relatively low affinity site, but uh, it's also uh, still uh, sort of uh, pharmacologically relevant concentrations. And here is another, uh, it's a derivative, a derivative of ketamine. A ketamine is a fast acting antidepressant and ketamine and this ketamine uh, derivative, they also bind uh, to track B. So in collaboration with Ilpo Vattulainen's lab uh, at the Department of Physics at the University of Helsinki, we have modeled uh, track B binding. And what we found is that first of all, track B uh, in the transmembrane domain as is detected here, is actually crossing the two monomers are crossing each other and making this X-shaped uh, structure. In synaptic membranes where the cholesterol concentration is high and the membranes are thicker, this, uh, this X-shaped structure doesn't appear to be uh, uh, stable. And uh, that's why at least one reason why track B receptors uh, are excluded from synaptic sites. What we found then is that uh, there is a binding site for fluoxetine uh, in the, uh, uh, it, on top of this X, and when this is happening, then in synaptic membranes, this uh, X structure and fluoxetine uh, resi residence in synaptic membrane is increased. And when this happens, then uh, BDNF has a bigger chance on, uh, of uh, activating its receptor. And we believe that this is the mechanism how antidepressants increase track B phosphorylation. And by the way, this would actually be a radically new mechanism for antidepressant action. Uh, we propose that uh, antidepressants don't act by uh, increasing serotonin in synaptic cleft, but they actually act by, uh, by uh, binding to, and, uh, to track B and increasing uh, thereby BDNF signaling. So uh, neurotrophic factors and BDNF have been involved in, uh, uh, in neural plasticity. And to uh, understand how uh, antidepressants might that increase BDNF signaling uh, might uh, regulate plasticity, we were using a classical model of uh, Hubel and Wiesel, uh, where uh, visual cortex uh, of, uh, of uh, mammalian visual cortex is investigated. And in this, uh, uh, in this context, the, uh, if you close one eye during early critical period of life, uh, that has a dramatic effect on uh, the uh, on the structure of the or the innovation of uh, of different uh, eyes on the visual cortex. So left uh, the closed eye is losing in competition, and the right eye, uh, the the open eye, uh, is now taking over. Uh, and this is only happening during the critical period and not in adulthood. So what we uh, wanted to do in collaboration with Lamberto Maffei's lab. We wanted to see that if you increase plasticity by antidepressants, would you actually in adult animal uh, induce uh, plasticity? Uh, and what we found here is that yes, indeed, if you don't give a drug, then you don't have any effect of, uh, uh, of, uh, of closing one eye for one week uh, because critical period is over. But if you do give the drug, then you have a dramatic shift in an ocular dominance. And this shift is uh, in the magnitude and uh, properties very much similar to what happens during the critical period. So we show here is that antidepressants actually activate a critical period plasticity in, in brain. What we also then, uh, it's important to know that if you don't close the eye, nothing happens. So fluoxetine, a drug is only actually a permissive, it's giving a possibility for the environment to give a new uh, guides and cues and then uh, change uh, the structure of the innovation. So, 
Uh, we have now been, my lab has been investigating the mechanism, several mechanisms, how this plasticity comes about. We call this induced plasticity or eye plasticity. And uh, in this uh, work that was done by Jules, uh, Jules Umemori, uh, Julie, uh, Giuliano uh, Didio, and uh, Frederick Winkel, and Angelina Leslikova, among other members of the lab, uh, we were looking at the interneur and the parvalbumin containing interneurons that are uh, powerful regulators of uh, cortical, uh, connect, cortical uh, activity. And uh, what we found is that if you remove track B receptors from these parvalbumin interneurons, then the effects of uh, antidepressant uh, fluoxetine here uh, on uh, uh, ocular dominance plasticity uh, is, uh, uh, is completely lost. So it appears that the track B receptors in these cells is, uh, is needed for, uh, for the antidepressant effects. Chuzo memory developed an, an opt optically activatable track B receptor that we can, the activity of which we can regulate by light. And what, uh, what he, uh, together with, uh, with, with Frederick Winkel, showed is that it, uh, you then uh, shine light, uh, express these receptors in the visual cortex, uh, shine light once, uh, once a day, 30 seconds, then you can actually activate critical period plasticity uh, by closing one eye. So basically what me this means is that uh, only activating track B receptors in palpable neurons is sufficient uh, for induction of, uh, of critical period-like plasticity in the brain. So my lab is now interest interested in uh, because this critical period like plasticity uh, is common to many different uh, different uh, human functions, actually very universal. Uh, then the, uh, the, and if you could then uh, after the closure of the critical period boost this uh, plasticity uh, to, uh, towards the same kind of level that you have in early life, that could have a, a very, you know, many uh, sort of uh, clinically relevant uh, uh, perspectives. And my lab is now focusing and looking at the mechanisms and uh, means of activating this critical period like plasticity in the uh, adult brain. And here's the group. Uh, we're working at the Biomedicum uh, Helsinki, and, uh, and I have a very international and, uh, and uh, uh, vivid and active group. And I'd like to thank here my group members and then all, uh, everybody, all of you in, in the audience about this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eho. We have uh, several questions. I will take the most upvote. Is plasticity essential for the antidepressant drug effect? Yes. So, I mean, now it's a little bit. Uh, uh, so, uh, what is it that you uh, that you uh, that you mean when you say antidepressant drug effect. So we have shown that uh, for the plasticity related effects, yes, uh, track B activity is, is related. But there are actually many studies and from many, uh, many, uh, many groups in addition to ours that show uh, that, uh, that median of track B activity is actually needed, uh, apparently needed uh, for, for the antidepressant effect. Also in the, uh, when, when they are used for uh, mood disorders. Okay, okay, we have a second question. Could track B signaling underlies cross modal plasticity, learning to learn? Well, uh, track B is, uh, is uh, and BDNF track B signaling is really critical for stabilization and selection of, uh, of, uh, of active synapses. So if you, it has been shown that uh, that kind of uh, changes in, if you want to have a, reversal learning, uh, changing your habits, then BDNF track B signaling it seems to be uh, required. So it is a quite a fundamental mechanism. And, and even though uh, we have not investigated this learning to learn mechanisms, uh, I think that uh, it would be a sort of safe uh, uh, assumption that, uh, that they would play a role. Okay, okay, thank you, Ero. We will continue with the next uh, PI. Marco. Our next speaker is going to be, uh, hang on, there are still no. slides there. I, but I, I turn off the video. So the next speaker is going to be Laura Barkonen from Aalto University. Uh, 
Okay. Thank you, Marco. Can you see my screen and hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, not your so, Sorry. We can see your face. You can or cannot. Yeah, we can see your face, but not okay. your your screen. <laughs> uh, okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. Good. So, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to give this Ignite talk. And of course, I would like to thank you also for the organization of the entire symposium in these uh, exceptional circumstances and having this record uh, number of uh, attendees. Right, but I will talk about my neuroimaging method groups uh, at Auto University. And uh, I've divided our research goals into three aims. We have uh, somewhat diversity in the, in the uh, uh, things we do. So first one is about improving neuroimaging methods. And uh, we particularly focus on, on methods that have high temporal resolution and could be applied non-invasively. So in this kind of a figure with the uh, time and space axis of all the ways to get data from the brain. So we would be working um, in, in this area. And the method of choice uh, is MEG. Of course, it's been around for quite a while already. It has high temporal resolution comparable to the uh, um, speed of neural signaling, but the spatial resolution could be improved quite a bit. And why is that? So in conventional MEG systems, the sensors are actually quite far from the brain. This is a realistic rendering with an adult head. So the blue rectangles are the, are the typical MEG sensors. And now if we could have the sensors on the scalp, so then the distance to the cortex would reduce to less than half. And uh, this means that we can actually improve the spatial resolution. So by our simulations, it seems that it's from three to six times better compared to conventional MEG if we have the sensors right on the scalp. And uh, fortunately, there is a, a rather recently uh, device technology to do sensors that you could actually put on the scalp. And these are called optic optically pumped magnetometers that are based on quantum optics. Uh, to put it simply, um, there is an appropriately tuned laser light that we shine through an alkali metal vapor and then have a photo detector to measure the transmissivity of the light. And uh, the transmissivity depends on the applied magnetic field. And this kind of a sensor provides sufficient sensitivity to do MEG. And since it's almost at room temperature, not quite, but uh, anyway, we can have some thermal shielding and put it right on the scalp. And uh, we have constructed a at this point, a small device to, uh, to do this kind of MEG measurements. And this is an example where the person is receiving visual stimulation. And we can see that we get uh, uh, on, well, a long lasting gamma activity for the duration of the stimulus, also alpha suppression. There is the uh, famous 40 hertz component that Christoph Koch mentioned yesterday as previously considered to be hallmark of consciousness, but I don't really think it's it's only that. Um, we have sufficient signal to noise ratio that we can even see on average responses uh, in the gamma range for this kind of stimuli. Then the second aim is to improve analysis techniques that, that we have. Um, and in, in that domain, one important thing is functional connectivity. So it's been thought already for a long time that uh, functional connections between brain region, regions are important for, for many, or I probably should say most cognitive functions. And also, on the other hand, the disruption of these connections uh, seem to be the underlying factor in, in many brain disorders. And what we are doing is that we want to improve the way we can estimate functional connectivity from, from MEG data. MEG is quite appropriate method for that because it does have the high temporal resolution. It has a, at least a decent spatial resolution so that you can separate the contributions of different brain regions. And to this end, we have um, developed a method that jointly estimates the, the, the sources from image of MEG signals plus their functional connections in one step. So traditionally, this has been two sequential steps, which has a lot of uh, problems, but now we were able to, to merge them into, into one. 
Uh, another uh, thing in the analysis is uh, the development of so-called closed loop experiments, uh, particularly with MEG. The idea here is that we do the measurement and then in real time, we analyze it, uh, typically apply machine learning methods to extract important information. And then we feed it back uh, to the subject by altering the stimulation. And why do you want to do that? So there is a reason for uh, in basic neuroscience, we can study learning and plasticity by providing brain state dependent stimulation. And one could also think about this as active sensing in charting uh, brain function. So you can direct the measurement to those uh, uh, things that we don't have too much knowledge yet. So in the same sense as we think that the brain itself is doing active sensing when exploring the environment. There are also clinical applications. Um, one could uh, think about controlling of prosthetic devices. This is, of course, a reality to some extent already. Uh, then what still remains to be shown is that one could possibly boost rehabilitation um, by doing this kind of a, a stimulation. And then maybe uh, use it also for treatment by induction in inducting long lasting uh, changes. But these are really things that still need to be shown. Then the third aim is to put it all this all together, apply it to systems and cognitive neuroscience. And uh, I don't go into the details. I've just listed a couple of uh, lines that, that we are working on. Uh, one is about performance monitoring. So how the brain monitors uh, your own performance. How do you react to errors? Or how does the brain react to errors? Also to positive and negative uh, feedback. Uh, then motor imagery that has uh, uh, clinical uh, goals. Uh, then we have also studied selective attention in, in vision and audition. And then um, the brain basis of social interaction by applying hyperscanning. So meaning that we, we do brain measurements of the uh, two participants that are in social interaction. So we are measuring the brain activity of both of them at the same time, and this has uh, some benefits in the in the data analysis so that we don't have to annotate the, the interaction itself. Right, so this is the, uh, uh, the, the team. I'd like to thank uh, all my uh, team members, uh, also collaborators, and of course the funding sources and the audience for the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions from the audience. How likely is it that OPM sensors detect pathological high frequency oscillations above 100 Hertz in patients? Uh, how about medial and deep structures? Okay, so the OPMs, there is indeed um, a, a limit for uh, the frequency uh, band that they can measure. So currently uh, we can go up to about 150 Hertz. So pathological oscillations, uh, somewhat above 100 hertz are still within the, uh, the range that we could detect. But then if it goes much higher than that, so then, then uh, uh, at least at this point, they would be difficult to, to measure. There's a trade-off between the uh, sensitivity and, and, and bandwidth. And then what was the second question? Well, it was part of the same question. Uh, like how, how about uh, medial and deep structures? Yeah. Well, that's a good point. So the deeper you go, then the improvement you get by placing the sensors on the scalp is going to be smaller. Uh, you still gain something, but it's not as drastic as, as, it, it is, as, is it, as it is for the lateral cortex. So for, for the deep parts, we don't, we don't get uh, so much improvement. Some still, but not much. OK. Um... Maybe there's time for, for a short question. Uh, many neuroscience groups working on rodents are now trying to implement the reverse translation approach, meaning that they'd like to replicate human protocols in their experience in mice. How would you advise them so that their work best informs your research on human brain? Well, that's a, that's a broad question and, and a very good one. Um, well, first of all, I think this kind of sort of bridging between species uh, is really important work. Um, well, the good thing about MEG is that, that since it's an electrophysiological measurement, so, so then we can, we can really have uh, responses with the same 
time resolution and, and quite often same shapes as you would get by, by sticking an electrode directly into the cortex. And I think these, these parts are, are the ones that you could use for, for bridging between the, the species. Also neuronal oscillations, uh, you can measure them with MEG, you can also measure them invasively uh, from the cortex. So I, th I think there are a lot of things that you could, you could use in, in such bridging. Thanks. Okay, so the, um, what we do is we use dual imaging to study, um, uh, uh -huh, okay, let me see, yes. Study your implementation of language function from perception and production to learning and disorders, and also extending towards continuous naturalistic language. However, um, the choice of neuroimaging measures may importantly influence the way we interpret brain function. And language actually also offers a behavioral extensively studied probe of higher cognitive processing, which may help us to understand functional relevance, roles, relationships between of different imaging measures, MEG, fMRI, local activation, inter-area connectivity. And in all these uh, different research questions, we are increasingly relying on advanced computational methods. All these aspects are relevant when we are, for example, um, seeking to elucidate brain organization of meaning and knowledge and individual variability in brain function. And as an example, I'm just showing how one approach of how we may study cortex processing of meaning. And a very a way it was initially um, actually approached was to use uh, sentences which create a very high expectation for a certain final word, like the piano was out of tune. And then one can play with the appropriateness of that final word in the sentence context. Like for example, the pizza was too hard to sing, so there's a totally wrong, semantically wrong ending or sentences of the type, when the power went out, the house became quiet, when most people would expect dark. So it would be an unexpected word, but it's semantically plausible. In the brain, in the left superior temporal cortex, we, between 200 and 600 milliseconds after word onset, we see this typically this type of pattern where we have a very strong response to the semantically wrong ending and very weak response to the totally fully expected final word. So the brain just doesn't bother anymore. It already knows. And then this, this plausible condition goes just there in between. And this type of graded response is uh, taken to imply that, there's, uh, that this type of response reflects semantic processing in some way. But what about um, cortical representations of individual item meanings? So what is a dog in a brain, for example? And, and we also have to, we have this kind of feeling that, that there's a relation, there's a structure to meaning. So that for example, dog, horse and cat, they are related because they're all household animals, boat, um, train, car, they are vehicles, we can travel somewhere with them. And then drill, saw, scissors, they're tools we can take in our hands and get stuff done. So how do our brains carry information about the qualities that form the item meanings and their relationships? This is where, for example, language technology can actually offer tools, like, for example, for modeling semantic relationships by the context in which the words appear in large text collections. So how we actually use those words in relation to other words. And there are two there are, there are methods like word to vec and others which, which find these kind of vectors for words. And then we can combine those such text-based models, brain data and machine learning and um, uh, try to learn the, um, the brain representations of the model features. And after that, we can, in principle, take any word and predict its brain activation pattern, or we can try to decode from the brain activation what the item might have been. And we use, have used this type of approach, for example, to, to study how meanings are, item meanings are formed from bits of information. And here the, um, we used a childhood guessing game where you're given clues of items. So here we, in every trial we give three clues like has legs, has a thick skin, has a trunk. And then the participant guesses, oh, elephant. And um, this is the type of the visualization of the semantic space spanned by the text-based model. 
So this really, of course, is extremely multidimensional, but this is just now forced into three dimensions for visualization. And here the, um, the, this, um, the, the orange dot represents the, is the coordinate in the semantic space that where we would get when we average the information from these, uh, for the vectors of these three clues, has legs, has a thick skin, has a trunk. Um, the blue dot is where the target word elephant would be. And the, and the green dot represents a sum of all kinds of properties that we would normally relate to an elephant, but a much wider variety. The kind of things we get when we ask people to freely produce uh, descriptors for an elephant. Then we get a huge set of descriptions and that's where there's the averaged coordinate would be. And now we can ask which of the coordinates best uh, corresponds to what's going on in the brain. And the result is that the cortical activation reflected after this recluse reflected um, in the presence of the whole range of semantic properties of the unpresent target. So it was closest to this green point. And it's not just the mere, merely the three clues, but it's a much wider, we kind of have a semantic completion going on. And also finally, as an example of the, the question of individual variability, which we tend to, we tend to associate it mostly, with, we th think of it in terms of behavior mostly, but also we are increasingly getting to, to, to find brain level handles to individual variation of similarity. And here, so we use Bayesian reduced trunk regression on MEG data from 100 sibling pairs. And we compute it um, uh, frequency spectra at each MEG sensor. And uh, for, so for, we have a spatial distribution as well. And now the aim was to find such spatial spectral compositions that would maximally differentiate between the phenotypes, that is the different families. And on the right, we have a um, coordinate uh, system spanned by two of such spatial spectral components, and each of the of the dots here they are they are one so one participant, and when we have for example two measurements from the same individual, the dots go really are just next to each other, and also siblings are very close to each other in this space, and it turned out that um, individuals could be recognized with very high accuracy across different tasks and recording sessions from uh, only a few seconds of data. So this type of approaches, we feel these are very promising for future of, of trying to see how understand similarities also from the point of the brain and not just behavior. So thank you. This was just a very short presentation as I think it was requested. And are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, oh. Well, I just got two questions. Uh, there's time for one, let me pick one. What's your take on Suzanne Cook Kreuter's definition of the human ego as a meaning making machine and a related question is meaning intrinsically inherent to an object or is it a data structure that our mind assigns to the object? Oh, for Plus God's sake. The object itself. Oh, you just, you just had to pick a really like a totally uh, philosophical question. Um, uh, I actually, I have no idea. I think we are only starting to understand what it, what meaning is from the point of view of the brain. I have to say that personally, I'm just thinking at this point, questions like, hmm, does it mean that we have these representations when we have this, uh, or does it mean that actually it's kind of like when we understand something, there's a network kind of stabilizing in our brain, which is kind of that representation. I'm at that level and philosophy, not there yet. Sorry, and maybe never for my part. Maybe others can then try to find them. So thank you for the question, but too difficult for me, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. It's time for our next speaker. Yes, another speaker from Helsinki University, Takashi Namba. Welcome. Hello. Hey, Aro, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I hope now you can see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the organizer of this great symposium. And hello, everyone. I'm Takashi Namba from Neuroscience Center High Life, University of Helsinki. I just started my new group here in Helsinki. So today I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to talk about the 
the, I'm trying to introduce what I am planning, planning to do here. Okay, so the brain size is basis of our intelligence. As you can see here, the brain size and its morphologies are tremendously, tremendously divergent among species, even within primates. Actually, human has biggest brain in the primate, and having smaller brain or larger brain are always pathological. So brain size matters. The biggest question is how to develop our brain with proper size. Why this is an important question. The, our brain got bigger during human evolution. If we think about the brain evolution, brain expansion in the opposite direction, it will answer how pathologically smaller brain, for example, microcephaly, is developed. Therefore, studying brain evolution will allow us to understand the etiology of neurodevelopmental diseases. The expansion of brain, especially neocortex, reflects the increase in the number of neurons. And obviously, this is achieved by the ex progenital cell expansion. So let me cl take a closer look of developing neocortex and focusing on progenital cells. In the case of mouse neocortex, there are two different germinal zones from apical side. There is a ventricle zone BC populated with apical larger growth cells. This type of progenital cells do not produce many neurons directly, but rather they produce secondary progenital cells, so-called basal progenital cells in subventricular zone, SBC. In the case of mouse, most of them are basal intermediate progenital cells, and the other type of basal progenital, so-called basal larger growth cells, are really, really rare. And Typically, these progen basal progenital cells divide once and produce neurons in cortical brain. Then how about in human case? As you can see here, the lambda structure is more or less same. There is ventricular zone, subventricular zone, and cortical plate. But the biggest difference is the thickness of subventricular zone. Because there are so many basal progenital cells in sub human subventricular zone, the subventricular zone is further subdivided into inner subventricular zone or ISBC and outer subventricular zone OSBC. And there, there are so many basal progenital cells, basal intermediate progenital cells, as well as basal larger growth cells. In the case of human, these basal progenital cells proliferate massively and expand their number, and finally produce huge number of neurons in cortical brain. So that now we are thinking that basal progenital cells are the key type of progenital cells for neocortical expansion and as well as neurodevelopmental diseases. Then the question is what kind of mechanisms regulate progenital cell expansion during human evolution? As a driving force for human evolution, the most fascinating mechanism is human specific genes. Because we were, we are thinking that there might be a positive selection on these human specific genes, and therefore the presence of these genes are beneficial for human. In the case of brain, it's cognition and intelligence. And we have, we are focusing on one human specific gene, so-called ARH gap 11b. We had quite strong interest on these genes because ARH gap 11B, in short 11B, is enriched in human neuron progenital cells, but not in neurons. And so far, what we know is when we ectopically express 11B in mouse neocortex by in uterine extirpation, that induces basal progenital cell expansion and subsequent enlargement and folding of neocortex. All of them are characteristic features in developing human neocortex. Then the next question is, how does even be induced basal progenital cell expansion? Recently, we found that even B is localized in mitochondria. And there, to cut the long story short, 
it will be as localized in mitochondria and bind to AMD adenonucleotide translocator and inhibit the opening of MPTP, mitochondrial permeability transition pore. And as a result of inhibition, the calcium concentration of mitochondria is increased. And as a consequence, the glutaminolysis, the utilization of glutamine to glutamine for the for fueling the TCA cycle, the glutamine glutamate and alpha ketoglutarate is increased. And in the end, you're going to be induced the basal progenitor cell -like proliferation. So now my, my results suggest that metabolism is a key regulator for human brain development and evolution. And in future, what I'm planning to do right now is I would like to understand the brain evolution more detail by from the aspect of project as a metabolism using metabolomics or something like that, and also identify the critical genes that regulate project as a metabolism. And the second aim is what happened when the, this progenitor cell metabolic network is disrupted, impaired. That will lead neurodevelopmental diseases such as microcephaly. So I would like to address, uh, I'd like to understand the etiology of uh, neurodevelopmental diseases from the aspect of progenitor cell metabolism. And in the end, you combine all of this data, I would like to understand the comprehensive metabolic ne network in brain development, evolution, and diseases. So, I, so here are my current and uh, past collaborators. And if you want to work with me as a peace student or poster, please email me here. So thank you so much for your attention. OK. Thank you a lot, Takashi. Mm, let, we have one question. Sure. Which techniques do you use to study brain metabolism? Well, as uh, so, I'm planning here. I'm planning to do metabolomics, metabolic flux analysis, or targeting metabolomics because the uh, Helsinki University has a very strong metabolic facility. And also what I'm doing is combined with the specific inhibitors and uh, culture with human tissues or mouse tissues with inhibitors and uh, analyze the outcome. So that is kind of easy way and very powerful tool. Okay, thank you a lot, Takashi. We'll now thank have you. a short break, five minute break before a wonderful talk by, by Gott Enable. Thanks for all our Ignite speakers. They will join us later in the panel discussion.